Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Find your ancestor in the paper with a quick search on Newspapers.com. Your family didn't need to be famous to appear in the papers. Start with the obituaries, marriage announcements, and birth announcements. Then go beyond to explore the local news, classified ads, photos, and more. Search through more than 760 million newspaper pages from across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and beyond in just seconds. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Hey! Hey! How y'all doing? From the top of season six. Yes, this is a new <laughs> raring season. We're ready to go. We're excited. We're glad to see everybody. Um, I missed you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. I missed you too. And this yeah. seemed to be a much for me, this seemed to be a much longer break than usual. Even though it was the same, you know, in terms of time, it was the same. It felt longer. What about you? Um well, you know, I got a lot going on, so I'm kind of rushed. <laughs> it's like August, all of a sudden, bow, it just just did this whole thing all between mid-August to not mid-August, I'm going to say end being just the like the last week in August to, to September, it was terrible. So now I'm like prepping for all of these new things. And, but Yes, yeah. preparation does seem to be the buzzword for us at the moment. Yeah. But um, you guys have been missed and we're so, so happy to be back. And we're going to do something that we haven't done in a little while. It's just going to be Donia and myself today. And we're going to be talking about something that I ref that we refer to as pathways of enslavement. So I just want to caveat this by saying that what we're going to actually be discussing isn't really anything new. It's just that we've applied a snappy little kind of catchphrase title to describe the kind of research that we have to do. So, I mean, if you've been following people like Mika Smith, Angela Walton Raji, um, Andre, I mean, there's just so many, Robin Foster. I mean, the, the names are endless. If you have been following anyone over the last 10, year, 10 to 15 years who have discussed how to do enslaved genealogy in particular, you're going to be familiar with a lot of the, the methodology. But by calling it a pathway of enslavement and identifying that that's what we have to do at every single generation will hopefully get you starting to think about things in a different way, how you approach it in a different way once you hit that 1870 census and go beyond that. Um, so I've got a couple of examples. Donnie has a couple examples. And Donnie, did you want to say anything before I jumped into um, that diagram? Um, yes, I want to say hi to people that are, are, you know, jumping in. So our regulars like Deborah Singleton, Jane Michael, um, who at Michelle, hey, from New Orleans. Uh, we, you know, our regulars are definitely here. Gina and and his, I think Cynthia is a new person. I've never seen your name. Welcome and thank you for joining us. So our, everybody is just like really kind of chiming in and I can't wait. Oh, and there's Nancy. So I can't, I can't wait to just, you know, meet new people and, and talk to you. There's my girl, LaCrissa Sims. That's the one. Well, so, there's, there's, and there's Bernice. And there's Bernice. We can't do anything without Bernice. So you know how that goes. But I love you guys. And I'm so glad wow. you guys are here. So when we're talking about a pathway of enslavement, um, Donnie and I actually had a re really good conversation in our virtual green room. Because I, I was saying there was one of three ways that an enslaved ancestor would be on an enslaver's property. And we had a little discussion and we, we agreed that there was actually a fourth. I was kind of tucking that fourth underneath one of the other three, but it's gonna be a standout. 
So what are the four ways that, an, that we feel an enslaved ancestor would be on an enslaver's property, especially by 1870, at least that last generation of slavery? Well, it's like they were either born there, so birth, they may have, or inheritance from either the male enslaver or the female enslaver side of the family. Because again, female enslavers tend to get left out of the discussion. They were enslavers too, and they inherited enslaved people from, from their, their family. So we have birth, we have inheritance, they could have been bought, um, or they were part of a dowry or a deed of gift. So those are the four ways, I'm gonna repeat them again. Birth, inheritance, a purchase, some description, so that could even be a sheriff sale or an estate auction. Anything like that is, I'm, I'm classifying that as being purchased. Or a dowry or a deed of gift. For those of you who aren't familiar with the deed of gift, that's kind of, in a way, that's kind of like a dowry where a woman was receiving property from her parents as part of her marriage settlement. Ah, oh, true. South Carolina did not call them dowries. South Carolina called them marriage settlements. So again, you're going to have to do a little research depending on the colony or the state where your ancestors were enslaved. To I challenge that. What's that? Because I've Brooks, actually... Brooks called it a dowry. Oh, he when did. He gave, yeah. When he gave his, when he get, well, the group that was given, um, I'll say, fifty cents people, mm -hmm. they were actually a part of a dowry given to the Dela 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 Font or Dela Port, whoever Brooks's daughter married that began mm -hmm. with a D. I always forget her name. <laughs> forget his <laughs> name. It comes to me later. But that particular family. That's the family that was told to 50 Cent was his enslaving family, when in actuality, it was the Brooks family, and they That's were funny. a part of the dowry. So, so it, could they be were just, it could just be a regional difference then within the state, because mm -hmm. when you're talking about Georgetown, Barclay, Beaufort, Charleston, Colleton, right. they're right. referring to them as marriage settlements. So can require a little bit of research on, your, on the audience's part to figure out how that particular kind of property exchange was called and where the where those records are at where you can actually find those records and i'm going to say for charleston in particular uh they are available on family search again uh awesome kind of things to work with a deed of gift is something that's different and you may even see this mentioned in a will saying um you know father is bequeathing some an enslaved person to a child saying but referring to the like a deed of gift or you know i've given this person as a gift to my son and daughter and now in my will i'm saying they're your property now um kind of a thing uh and again there's plenty of information about that so i'm gonna try to share my screen in a minute uh, you should screen. be able to just yeah it should be able yeah. to just pop up Right. It, let me see. Hold on, because <laughs> this thing be acting crazy. Did it share for you? I think it did. Nope. I just popped it up there. Okay. So is, is it actually showing? It is for me. It's, it's Now it is, yeah. And I'm looking at it on the... It, it just popped up. Okay. Okay. We're good. What are you doing? Of course, Prezi doesn't want to. I am so sorry about this. Here we go. So, so, can you, so basically, the, the cutting point for us is always the 18. When you're talking about an enslaved ancestor is the 1870 census. And we've already done a show about this, so I'm not going to kind of reinvent the wheel. But it's just some things for you to think about. So can you find your ancestors before the 1870 census? whether you're looking for them under just the family group, under just their first names in case they had a different surname, but have you tried finding them in the 1860 or the 1850 census? Well, 
So, Brian, I want to interrupt you real quick because I want to make sure we're seeing the slide that you want because I hear a lot of clicking from you uh -huh. and there's nothing happening on my end. So if there's the, the first slide that is showing up is in yellow, it has slaveholder underneath it. It has slaveholder Edward 1777, 1858. So no, that's the, that's when I clicked it. Now, if I need okay. to Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Um, I'm gonna cancel. Because you might can't handle it. I I might have to do it. So this is our first time, guys, sharing the, the slides for us. We've actually shared it for others, but we're just realizing we've never done it for ourselves. So please bear with us. Mm -hmm. Now, that should be a different... No, you just took it completely off. It's gone now. So that's not showing my screen at all. Okay, no. I'll, I'll just talk through. It, so long as they can see you, I'll just talk through what I have. So we always have the 1870 census. We want to see the land that our, our, who we suspect were our enslaved ancestors are living on. So we're looking for things like, you found the family group. Was there a real estate value next to their name? If there wasn't one, and they're also, I'm going to ignore personal effects at the moment. We're just looking at land value. If they, if there was no value of real estate given on the 1870 census, and they're living a lot around a lot of other Black families, but if you keep scrolling up and go to the previous page until you get to the first family that actually has a real estate value next to their name, nine times out of 10, they're going to probably be white because, they're, again, they're going to have a significant amount, of, you know, hundreds of acres, basically. That is the suspected, that is the landowner. So already we're beginning, you know, getting the sense that we're looking at someone who was a freedman, you know, a family of freedmen and women who, even though the sharecropping system hadn't been formalized and set up that way, were still living perhaps on the, the plantation of their last enslaver. So what do we have to do from there? Again, we always, the question that we always have to try to answer for an enslaved ancestor Four questions to answer. Why were they on that land? Was, were they born there? Were they inherited? Were they purchased? Or was it a form of um, a gift, like a dowry? <clears throat> so now this requires you have to research the land owning couple where you found your enslaved family in 1870. So, so one thing that you can do, um, and we're, Donnie's going to talk about one of her favorite record sets, is you can try to find their Freedman labor contract. And Donnie, can, can you talk a bit about why those are really good? So um, for, I wanted to tell you that I went on ahead and I found a slide that was um, comparable with what you said and I placed it up there. Mm -hmm. And I, cause it's very important that everybody realize cause that was a conversation that I actually had with someone. And this is what he's talking about, the highlighted portion where it says, um, 7,800 and 2,000. A lot of us don't pay attention to those estate and real estate. So that's the length, that's the 1870 census where it says the value of real estate owned. You got personal and then you have this, this the whole thing, the, the amount of um, land that they own all together. So this particular Per, this particular person, Charles Burkhalter, owned 7,800 acres of land, but 2,000 of it was personal. And so what Brian was trying to pull out to you guys that if you notice all of these Black people, notice this is page five. All these Black people were living on his land. Mm -hmm. That's page six. And again, this so is again because Edgefield, I think we had this conversation as well. Edgefield was really interesting because the enslavers lived on the property where they had their enslaved people. Whereas right. on the east shore, eastern shore of South Carolina, so again, Georgetown, Barkley, Charleston County, all around there, they, they were living in Charleston City. They had, their right. they had their beautiful townhouses and they occasionally 
would go to the plantation, but a very different dynamic. Right. So right. So you, you can ahead. end up scrolling quite a bit in those eastern shore counties before you get a sense of who the, the landowner was. Exactly, exactly. So now that you guys seen that, now I want to show you the labor contract that he was talking about and why they are so very, very important. Um, so labor contracts through Freedmen's Bureau is basically um, where the person who was living on, the enslaved person who used to live on that land now have to do a contract. And with that particular contract, they have to say, I'm going to take care of this person. You're going to do this for me. And I'm going to do this for you. So this was their quote unquote way to, as far as um, making a contract with the enslaved. So what I'm getting ready to show you guys right now, because we're going to use Martha as an example. Well, I'm going to and, ask uh, you while you're pulling that ahead. up. How many mm -hmm. times have you seen a correlation between the landowner in the 1870 census where your enslaved ancestor was living and the same person having a labor contract with their enslaved people? I'm going to say 95% of the time. Okay. No, I, I'd go with that. I, I, I would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 95% of the time, the people that you are going to, that are living on that land, you'll find a contract with their names on it. So this is a labor contract for um, Martha Brooks, but not just for Martha, because this one right here is going to be, it's, it's really different. She, her last person that she was um, with was Lemuel Brooks. Now, some say Lemuel was a cousin. Some say he wasn't. I think he was, but I do understand that I have not found a lot about it. But this contract, as y'all can see that I'm scrolling up and down, it, it really just kind of talks about all of the people that he was speaking to. And then on the other side, they signed. So you have Ben and Phyllis and Adam, all these people were signing. But look down here at this one. This one was for Martha. And the contract was so different for Martha than it was, because see, here's her name. I'm making it big so you can see it. That's my Martha. This person right here, I'm hoping you guys can see that. Um, hers was written, notice, first of all, it was written separately from everybody else's. And his wording over here, when you look at it, it says, uh, I'm well, that's find okay. one. Because while you're doing, because really all I wanted to do with this was to make the link that this is the late oh, okay. one of the late the later rungs for Martha in terms of her pathway of, of enslavement. Right. And right. How, okay. How did this help you, or how did this point you in the direction that you needed to go with her Brooks family enslavement? Because you got okay. this. This mapped out with what you found in the 1870 census. Right. What did you right. do? Right. Okay. So basically, so I'm going to remove this because I was getting ready to go into a whole, thank you for pulling me out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to go into a whole tangent. But what I got from that, the way I got to that point, so we went from me seeing Lemuel, knowing that Martha was living on that land, going in the direction that I showed y'all, and then going and searching for Lemuel Brooks and finding his contract that had the names of all the people that were on his um that that were living on his land. Once I did that, I was able to really kind of follow her life from that. Like I I know where she was. I have that she was first. I know who all three of her enslavers were. Um DNA pointed me to the fact that I'm related to them. So you found her, you found her mother. I found her with God. I found her mother. I found her possible father. I found, well, I'm thinking that's many, the father because that's the direction that we went. I found all many, of her siblings. Yeah, I was going to say, how many siblings were there in the end? There are. I can look at that real quick mm -hmm. for you. And while you're looking, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> Christina Mullinex asked a really good question um, about labor contracts. Know that they're not just 
for South Carolina. Um, they were for all. If you go to the fam, if you go to Family Search Wiki, and look up the the labor contracts, it'll tell you all of the slaveholding states where they were enacted. Now, the thing with labor contracts is not all of them were filed in the county where the people were enslaved. They were filed in the largest, nearest population center. So right. for the one with Martha Brooks that, that Donnie was reading from, that was actually filed in Abbeville, not Edgefield. Yeah, it was. Because a lot of the um, Edgefield labor contracts are in Abbeville. Yep. Why? Don't know. But that's where they are. I don't know. Maybe that's where they were doing their courthouse thing. I have no I, idea. I but think maybe as, Edgefield was a little bit too root and tootin'. Yeah. Just a little there bit were too... six siblings. They sure six. were. Okay. There, there were six siblings. But the thing is, when we talk about the pathway of enslavement for Martha, I also was able to get the will and find her in a will. And and it was in it was in Whitfield's will when I found her. Or when we we found her, uh, Natan directed me to Trisha, and we found her in there. And it was from all of that that information, which was so great, because you know, you guys, we have our Bible, our in, in slave record book. Well, what was so great about the thing with Martha and following her pathway was the fact that I actually was able to count the amount of enslaved people that Whitfield had, and then he turned around and died in 1850 on his slave schedule. So everybody knows the slave schedules are just the, you know, whether they're male or female, their gender and their age. Well, his slave record was the exact number of people on his will inventory. It was the same amount. So I got lucky. I will say that. I got lucky. And I was able to actually get the people, the names of people, which you normally don't, aren't able to get. I got the names of everybody on that 1850 slave schedule. So that's one of the reasons why I found it, because the 1850 was set up in a certain way. You know, sometimes you get, you just get lucky. And I got lucky with it because he had so many families and they were set up as families and I was able to count them and, and all of that. But that was just a, a whole piece of it. So we have a lot of different ways as far as to following that pathway. And Evan Selp raised a good question. Um, he has seen a document relating to, or an ancestor um, relating to apprenticeships. If the word apprentice appears for a person of color um, in the civil, you know, in the slavery era, they were a free person of color. Enslaved people, they could be, enslaved people could be hired out. That was not considered an apprenticeship. Um, if you've specifically seen an apprenticeship document, that's a free person of color. Um, and I, Anyone in the audience, especially Bernice, if you care to chime in on that one, I don't think I've ever seen an apprenticeship document for um for an enslaved person. Right. And Patricia Lee wanted to know where labor contracts can be found. They can be found on Family Search. Yes. So if you go into Google or whatever your preferred search engine is, just type in Friedman labor contract and Family Search, and it'll take you straight there. Um, Gina Lewis raises a good point, and I've seen this occasionally in my dad's side of the family, but a lot of when she was able to find a freedman contract for an ancestor, it was not the person that enslaved them. So there is, a, there is always that. She raised, and I, I kind of get it. <clears throat> she was saying that it, it felt as though maybe her ancestors felt a kind of way about their enslavers and didn't want to stay on their property. I mean, you do have that happening where they just move and leave. They're, if they have that opportunity to leave, then they would leave. Um, I think with South Carolina, though, you know, they kept though they they kept their enslaved people so poor and you know so downtrodden that they really might not have been able to leave, even if they wanted to leave. And I think the the intelligence of those that were in South Carolina, they were like, "Oh, you don't want me to leave? Okay, well, I am carrying your name." And I'm gonna keep it because that was Martha. But I also want her and the rest of the audience because I'm gonna cycle back to the original image that um that I had up. So again, would you say, Donnie, the fact that Martha shared the same surname as her enslavers 
was a clue, was a useful clue, not a useful clue? How did that work for you? Um, I'm going to say that it was a useful clue because me, it was so fresh. It was so um, fresh into my research when I found her. I was brand new when, when I found her. That's the first thing you think about as a new researcher. You're like, oh, my enslavers had, I mean, my enslaved person carried the name of my enslaver. That was what you just automatically thought. You never thought about a changing of a name or anything. So first I had to get to her. Let's be clear on that because she, Brooks is not, there it is. That's it, Brian. Mm -hmm. Brooks oh, no. is, that's, you got it? Mm -hmm. I was just saying, yeah. I'm carry on. <laughs> Oh, no, but I had to get to her because Brooks is not my family name. Yeldale is my family name. So finding her and understanding that my grandfather's grandmother was a Brooks was really crazy because one minute you see her as a Brooks. Next minute, she's still a Brooks. But now she's changed all of the younger children's names to Yeldale. And that includes my grandfather's father. Peter. So I had to get to that. And I'm like, I was learning things really fast because it was just an amazing, mm -hmm. it, it, it was different. Asheville is, is different. Because as we've been saying, you know, the with the 1870 census, it's getting that last rung in that pathway of enslavement that will hopefully reveal the previous ones. So Donnie actually mentioned that, you know, she was able to identify the last, you know, the three enslavers for Martha Brooks, and then we had got her mother's name, and we know about which family members enslaved her mother. And we just keep going back, going back that way. Because again, what we want to do is, and I'm going to walk you through an example now, depending on when your ancestor was born, who was appearing on the 1870 census, and living on an enslaved, you know, an enslaving, a formerly enslaving family's land, you have to research those formerly enslaving families, both the man, you know, the man and the woman, um, to see if you can find that ancestor or any other family members in their in their record records, whether those are probate records or deeds or whatever they are, to see if you can see their names. Now we're thinking, and surnames are definitely a clue. Um, they're, I think, one of the most least discussed kind of clues, and I think that's because we don't really have a full understanding of how the majority of formerly enslaved people actually came by their surnames, apart from those who knew that they were biologically connected to the surname that they were using. So I'm going to give you a, a working kind of example of, of me involving one, a research client that I'm working with at the moment. Again, this is South Carolina, very different part of South Carolina, east, eastern coast. So I have an enslaved gentleman whose name was Colin Mitchell. He's born about 1794, and he's born somewhere either in Charleston County or Barclay County, because he's born on one of the um, the kind of Charleston Harbor Islands, it's the best way that I can, can think of to, to explain what, what that was. But he's born about 1794. His age, you know, when he's referenced can, you know, ranges anything from five to eight years. So, you know, 1794, I'd say, give or take, five to eight years either side. So he, his last enslaver, or his second to last enslaver, was actually a, a gentleman called George Edwards, who was born about 1777. And George Edwards had two wives, a Miss Barksdale and a Miss Wyatt. So I had to try to understand. So already I'm seeing the surname Mitchell, I'm seeing Edwards, I'm seeing Barksdale, I'm seeing Wyatt. What I wasn't seeing in the enslaved side of the family, at all, the enslaving side of the family at all, was a Mitchell connection. These are families that I knew really, really well, especially the Barksdales. Um, and it would find, I found it really confusing that I was finding, it I'm like, well, how did a Mitchell end up with people who were Barksdales and Edwards. I'm, I'm just not seeing the connection. So I went to George Edwards. I took a look at, you know, realized he was born 1777. The likelihood that Colin was, and I thank the Lord that Colin had a distinctive name for where he was enslaved because there really weren't that many of them, which made it a lot easier to kind of find him. So I'm like, well, he's 1794. His, you know, almost lost enslaver was born 1777. 
I felt that a maybe 20 something year old would have been too young to have his own plantation or, you know, and Edwards was, um, he had quite a few large scale plantations. I felt that he was too young at the age of 20 to have had an enslaved person. So the likelihood that Colin was born on George Edwards land was non was I felt was almost impossible. Um, so I really had to look at George's parents. Well, his father died in 1787 and even given an eight year age range for Colin, Colin was born after George Edward's father died. Um, may have been on his Barksdale's mother's estate inventory because she died in 1791. That was within the range of when Colin may have been born. So I would have been looking for a child or an infant named Colin in her estate inventory, which I found. And there was not, there was no one, not even a close name to that. So I knew that Colin wasn't coming from George Edward's parents. So unfortunately he did marry twice. That meant that I had to research both of his wives, identify, correctly identify their parents and pull their parents' probate records. Nothing, nada, nothing close to the name Colin whatsoever. So I'm like, okay, you weren't born on either George Edwards' property, his parents' property, or anything to do with either of his wives, where did you come from? Well, they kind of left me with one option, purchased. So I went to, I went to family search, did a search on the catalog on Charleston County, got all of the records. There's an amazing one about basically slave sales in Charleston County where I knew that where this transaction more than likely would have taken place, I immediately found Colin. I found a sales deed for Colin um, involving being sold to George Edwards in 1809. And he was the property of a Thomas Mitchell. There, so I finally, finally by, by really limiting and really understanding how an enslaved person came to be on someone's property, I identified the most likely origin story for Colin, for the enslaved man, Colin Mitchell. And that was through Thomas Mitchell. And I was not letting me do it. I actually had the deed, um, but it's it's not showing on that slide, unfortunately. You need me to mold it. There it is. is oh, this there it? it is. That's it. <clears throat> so there you go. Page 202. I can't remember the, the, the name of the book. State of South Carolina. There we go. Actually, it was Thomas Lassan, who was the appointee of Thomas of Thomas Mitchell. So there, there's the important name. There's Thomas Mitchell, um, and there he is, George Edwards, and then there's Colin, right there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, by just really kind of breaking envisioning the enslavement as a pathway through multiple generations um, really kept me laser focused on the kinds of records that I needed to find and then understanding where they, if they still existed, where they were most likely to be found. Um, and as I said, when I first started the research, I was really honest with the client. I'm like, I have never come across the name Mitchell before, not on Fripp Island, not on Sandy Island, Spring, all the islands I was looking at and researching. I'm like, I have never seen this name. Where is your Mitchell name coming from? As I said, um, breaking it down, working methodically, thinking step by step where Colin could have come from, found the deed that just broke the, broke the whole thing wide open. So I'm still researching Thomas Mitchell. Um, Don't you love it when you find those deeds that just bow? It just makes everything make sense. They do. So am I okay if I just click remove from studio? I, I, I already did it. I already did it. <laughs> you know, I'm terrified about that stuff. I know. I already did it. I took care of it for you. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope that was clear. Um, how you can try to identify an enslaver even when surnames aren't matching up or mapping up and you just don't really understand where it's coming from. As a matter of fact, with another client who is in um, Louisiana, I'm trying to understand how an enslaved husband and wife born around 1800 in Virginia ended up in Lafouche Parish 
Louisiana by 1870. Um, because there are no war, there are no Warren families, no enslaving Warren families. There are other enslaved Warrens, which makes it really interesting, who were also born in Virginia, but there's no enslaving Warren family. Um, the lands where they're all living in, researching the wives in particular, that Warren name in Virginia just never comes up. Um, that sounds like the senior family. Mm -hmm. We have no idea who they are. But in this case, it looks as though maybe a slave trader was involved, that they were sold to a slave trader in Virginia, brought down to Louisiana and sold. And of course, trying to find the name Christopher on, a, on the south, you know, those southbound Louisiana slave ship manifests. Because again, we had, mm -hmm. a show about, we had a show about that. For the time period involved, there must have been about 30, 35 Christophers or kids. Because you know, we have to factor in abbreviate abbreviations of names. Trying to identify him on his own was a nightmare. And his wife's name is Betsy. Mm. So, you know, that continues. That that work still continues. Okay. Um, so I'm just looking at a question from D. Yeah, I had I was gonna ask you, can I go into some questions? Sure. No, by all means. So D asked three different questions. One was about George Washington. I don't know. You might be able to answer it. I can't because I haven't done anything on George Washington. So she said, um, George Washington and Martha Washington's family transferred enslaved citizens by what mechanism? I, I have no idea. Um, was it by deed or gift? And transferred to Martha Custis and, and from Martha Washington after his death. So she's on her way back to... Mount Vernon, and she need to know. <laughs> um, I don't think there was an instrument that they didn't use. I mean, I think they used any any instrument involved that they could transfer in a slave person that they could. Um, I'm not aware of, just in my, my kind of initial research on the, the Washington enslaved people, um, I'm not aware of any of them going back to Mount Vernon. Okay. Especially once they, then, once they hit to, once they get to Custis. And again, the Washingtons are kind of confusing because <laughs> they, and again, Martha Washington's enslaved people were her enslaved people. George may have told them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but believe me and trust, Martha was all business. She knew who her enslaved people were. So she okay. manumitted hers when, in her will, he manumitted his in his will separately. Okay, and then the second question, the second question that she asked was, um, Danya, she said, Danya, could women own property outright or could men only run ownership? I'm going to say women could own, but it would have to have been, um, women could own and even, in, well, not enslaved, um, mulatto or free people of color also own because Rebecca was the owner. Um, she owned property. I'm not going to say she, well, technically I can say she kind of owned enslaved people because her husband was her daughter, was willed to her daughter and trust for her daughter. So her daughter, which was a baby, Clarissa at the time, she actually owned her father in case the other person, which was Edward Settles, my fourth great grandfather, in case he died, they was making it possible so that George, which was Rebecca's husband and Clarissa's father, would never be, quote unquote, enslaved again. So that's what happened as far as, yes, I'll, I'll say yes, they could own. And then also Rebecca was owning land, too, so that Edward fought for. And then the final question from her is um, for you. She says, Brian, when were Black families allowed to own land, and when did you find many of these transactions? What were some of these mechanisms that facilitated this process? Was it a, a patriarchy, tra patriarchy transfer? So, Brian, I'm, I'm gonna. Not sure, I'm not sure what's meant by patriarchy transfer, but sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I'm a, I'm a piggyback on that. The patriarchy transfer is probably was it from male to male, because you know just because patriarch is the man, so probably male from male to male, but where she put, can black families own land? Are we talking about during the civil war or 
after the Civil War because you beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, that that <laughs> those free, are, free people of color could always own land. They could always own exactly. Free people of color could always own, but couldn't black vote. People didn't start loan, owning until right. Couldn't vote, <laughs> but you black could, people started owning after the Civil War ended. They started owning because of um Gail. Gail's family were owners. They were part of that, and I think uh Bernice can talk about this because this was something that Gail used to talk about with us. Mm -hmm. I think her family was a part of 2% of African Americans owning land right after the Civil War. And that's a two, y'all. I wasn't doing the three. It looked like a two. Well, my, again, <laughs> my four times great-grandfather, Lewis Matthews, you know, he, in his father's will was a provision. I guess Drury Cook Matthews could kind of see the writing on the wall, kind of knew that slavery had, was on its kind of lost legs. And he actually made provisions that should slavery end, Lewis was to get 300 acres, I think in the Northwest past, I mean, he was really specific. Like, he knew what plot of land he wanted Lewis to have. And bless him, at the end of the Civil War, his sister transferred that land over to, over to Lewis. So he was, he was a property owner straight off Jump Street. Right. So Nancy Bray said that um, she found a freeman's contract with a woman with the same name as her three times great grandmother in Newbury in 1866. But this person is 43 miles from Columbia, which is where her enslaving family lived. Could this be my ancestor? I'm going to say, yeah, if it sounds like them and walks like them, well, it might say be <laughs> You just have you just have to really do your due diligence. I mean, you, yeah. have, to be on, you have to be honest about how common a name that she may have had, um, mm -hmm. especially age, you know, age as well. Did she already have a connection to the area to Newberry? You know, right. Anything like that that would be kind of a, a pull for her. But right. um, I think that the good thing about Nancy's question is that. We have a family member right now who's really kind of hell bent on thinking one thing, and it's not it's not it. But the thing is, is that you got to remember all of the names that we play over and over and over again. And sometimes you want to believe that that's them because it feels like it's them to you for whatever reason. But you have to take everybody else into play when you're doing that. So I say that to say, let's say if you felt like this person is your family and because she is living in the area where your family came from, well, now you need to see which way does that person go that's in that will. Follow that person in that will. See if you can figure out where they were if you see them on that labor contract and if that labor contract coincides with that 1870 census and that same person and is that your person that's coinciding with that person and then you know those are the ways that you can really follow that but you have to follow it don't make it fit just you it's got it's going to end up fit it has to fit everybody you're not the only person and it has to fit everybody which kind of brings me back to my point about common names whether it's right. first names or surnames um you know they're just going to be some surnames that are just incredibly challenging and difficult to research like williams and edgefield um, hmm. and if it wasn't for the fact that a huge white why DNA study was done and i think it's either family search or 23 and me i can never remember which DNA company that Y DNA study is done if you, done on, but you know it's identified anything from five to seven distinctly different unrelated Williams family Y DNA, um, and unfortunately all of all of the different Williams families were all naming their kids the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and Elaine um, Senior, she said that you know that my senior family. There's slave owners in Jamaica. I was actually told by Bernice when she traveled to, I think it was Barbados, that she actually saw a lot of seniors there. So I do believe my seniors were um, of Caribbean descent. 
I do believe that. But the fact that they popped up the way that they did, and even the land that they're living on, we, we can't even find anything on that particular person. It's it's so crazy. We don't know who they are. We we we, we really just don't know. When I tell y'all this family appeared in 1870 and, and had 16 children by 1880, and then only four of those kids, we now know who they are. Only four. We don't know what in the world happened to the other 12. And until DNA pops up for them, that's how we know who they are, because we have no clue. None whatsoever. Now, as I said, <clears throat> sometimes names can be a really big help. I know, I know that with my own Sheffy family, the fact that my enslaved Sheffies were always held, even if it was amongst extended family members within the same Sheffy family. Mm. Um, so getting their pathway from the 1870 census all the way back to right before the Revolutionary War was a pretty straightforward process. Um, it was just a family who did not believe in selling their enslaved people away, um, and especially selling their enslaved family members away. Um, so it's, like I said, sometimes it's um, it can be pretty straightforward, other times not. And again, you know, what we've been spending almost the last hour talking about, this is what makes African-American genealogy unlike any other genealogy in this country. Because maybe down the road, someone can come up with a much more streamlined way than, than I have. But as I said, you know, from the 1870 census, it's trying to figure out who the last enslaver was. Then depending on when that enslaved ancestor was born, how many different sets of ancestors on the enslaving side of the family do you have to look at? Parents, grandparents, Moses Williams. How far back do we have to go to we, from 1870 with Moses Williams? We, and because he lived to be 115, had three or three generations of enslavers. You had Daniel Williams II, you had his son, and you had a grandson. Yeah. And you had a grandson. You and did. there's still one more enslaving generation in there, even though he was no longer enslaved by the Williams family. He was down in Barnwells. That we had identified four different levels of enslavers just for one person. Just for one person, exactly. Bernice said the Freedmen's Bank and Trust Records definitely opened the door for me to find my ancestors' connection to the governors of South Carolina. I mean, it the fact, first of all. Being from that, having family from that Edgefield area is probably one of the most exciting things to me because when I tell you we connect to so many people that are either in history or should be in history, it is fascinating. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, D asked another question be, and Brian, this might be a good question for the, uh, the dude that you don't brought, um, the Pierce Butler type mm -hmm. thing. She said, were people omitted from labor contracts and census records, as was the case in the Low Country Gullah genealogy? Because I didn't know that they were omitted. Um, well, I think the, the labor contracts were a fairly voluntary thing. Um, Maybe there was some coercion involved in them, but I've never heard of people being deliberately missed out. I knew of people who chose, I knew of enslaved, sorry, I shouldn't call them enslaved people, freed men and women who chose not to be bothered with labor contracts. You see them living on the land in 18, you know, on someone's land in 1870. You see that that person has had labor contracts with every other family living on their land, except for one or two families. Now, yeah. what the deal was there, I have no idea. Anybody right, and they could have been they could have been just chosen not to do it. Um, I don't think I'm going to say chosen because you're fresh out of slavery, so you either going to do what I say or not. I think they still too much had that kind of a mindset for that, but there had to have been some reason why those people mm -hmm. didn't do it. Um, now, as far uh, as, go ahead. I was going to say now, and the second part of uh, the question, which is really good, is I know my dad's side of the family in the depths of Southwest Virginia, all the way in the Appalachians, um, there were newly freed Black families that hid from the census takers because mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't want the white people to know where they were living. 
Right, right. So, um, right. So now, I, as far as the Brooks family, because she says the Brooks families were favored, just like the Yaledale clan. It is so funny that she says that because the white Yaledales were known, but I don't believe they were favored because they treated their enslaved people so differently than others. As far as the Brooks family was concerned, the person that was favored was Preston. He was the one, they literally called him a son of South Carolina. They just put that man on a straight pedestal. So I, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one, D. I, the Yeldale clan, people don't even know who Yeldales are until I mention, until they become related to us. And they're like, who is that? <laughs> you know, so I, I, it's weird. Yeah. And South Carolina researchers... Please don't forget that there is an 1869 South Carolina state census on family search. It is not yes. indexed. Unfortunately, it is not indexed. It is grouped by county, but you have to go image by image. By image. Better to have, but it exists. As long as I'd rather have that than have nothing at all. And it works very similarly to the 1840, 18, um, to pre-1850 censuses, only the head of household. Is yes, nice. yes, and they they mark out how many children are in that house, how many are males, how many are females. It's mm -hmm. it's very sim it's very similar to pre eighteen fifty, and but so, it's very useful, very so I, very. I was going to say to D, um, there may not be an eighteen seventy census for some of the sea islands in South Carolina. I would try the eighteen sixty nine census just to cover your bets. Um, also, some counties weren't counted. In it. it took me the longest time to figure out that the 1869 census, Barclay County, seems to be missing. Barclay was lumped in with Charleston. That for that census year, that state census, for whatever reason, that happened. Um, mm. Yeah, Lucretia, I know the Williams line is is very difficult because Williams is such a common name, um, but. All I can say is you might have to depend on DNA for it and it'll kick you, it'll at least kick start you. Like for example, the Petersons that we're dealing with right now, you know, when Brian and I and Loretta and I think who else was with us working with us for the Petersons, but wasn't it just us three? I think it was just us three. Oh no, it wasn't, I think Sharon, Sharon Rue was one. I, Sharon Rowe was one, that was the other person. The thing about the Petersons was when you know, we were doing all this research on these Petersons and we, you know, ancestry, genealogy is a guess. It's a, it's a, your best guess on what's going on. But then we ended up getting this letter and the letter literally confirmed everything that we said about the people. And then we turned around and started doing the DNA and then the DNA followed suit on that research, which made it even better. But now, I, you know, right before, right after the DNA kicked in, we started finding um, Peter Peterson. We figured out that Peter Peterson was enslaved by a man named Thomas Peterson and was probably his son. But it wasn't until now where things are really starting to kick in that we started. Well, wait, we also learned that there were other Petersons and there was Joshua Peterson and Wash Peterson. We were seeing these people. And we were like, are they Peter's brothers? Is that what's going on? So we would start putting them there. And once we put them there and everything, you know, it looked right. Well, now we have DNA. Well, to give them just a little context, because we were seeing them living either near each other or close mm. to each other. And they were also naming a lot of their kids the same names or naming their kids same after. After, After each, each other. other. Yes. Because there was a Peter, there was a Joshua, you know, all yeah. of that. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't want you guys to think that we were just plucking that out of the ether. There was a, there were reasons behind what we were thinking. Yeah, yeah. But now the DNA has pushed us in that direction. And as you all know, I call my mama, um, I call her Eve because she relates to almost everybody. And uh, with that being said, all of these people now, at first we only had one person who was kind of was matching via DNA towards one of the guys we said was either a brother or a son. Well, now we're, the DNA is showing 
and more people on from that one brother is testing and he is a brother joshua is a brother of peter peterson like we thought and all of the dna is popping in and it's popping in fitting right where it's supposed to and that's the same thing with wash i got one i just told brian today i got a connection um with someone and they are through wash peterson's line so for those that don't know who are from edgefield and who have peterson line peterson blood and if you was ever doubting me and Sharon and Brian and um, Loretta, don't doubt us because we are right on the money for that one. <laughs> I love it. Well, there was one other resource I wanted to touch on quickly as well. So going back to that um, Colin Mitchell example that I gave. So I'm pretty sure that Colin Mitchell was born. I don't think he was a child of, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he was born on Thomas Mitchell's um, Fripp Island plantation. It's not Fripp Island, um, Spring Island plantation, and I'm um, just outside of Charleston County. So what I really need to prove that is Thomas Mitchell's day book or his plantation book, his ledger, wherever it was that he listed the birth of slaves. I need that. And to say that I have contacted everyone in every major kind of repository in South Carolina, um, even the one at North Carolina Chapel Hill, because that actually has a lot of South Carolina records. I don't know if people realize that. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, lots of South Carolina, probate records, tax records, all that kind of stuff. They have it. Exactly. Um, just kind of striking out on that one at the minute. Um, but yeah. that would be good paper proof to prove where he was born. Well, that's our show. We have learned that we need to start breaking a loop sooner <laughs> in order to make things work. So um, I hope you guys definitely enjoyed today's show we will get out next week's show to you and i'm glad to be back how about you brian i am glad to be back we have um the, the first three months we've got some really really awesome shows of course i'm going to be we biased do. but we have some awesome shows lined up yes we do we do we do so i'm donya i'm brian and, and i just want to say thank you guys see you next week 4 p.m yes bye <laughs>